Lois, give me a glass of water. I am sorry to ask that. I just, <coughs> I don't know if I'll make it. Thank you, sister. Uh, since we have a little bit of time before we get started, I just wanted to uh, remind you that we are uh, actively looking for anyone that might like to help sing and lead vocals. I, I love it. At the same time, I, I don't want to hog all the fun. So if you, if you would be interested in uh, helping lead, that would be great. Joel is going to be coming back in October with uh, the rest of the rest of the band. Is that what we call the, the band? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, sister. Thank you. We'll be in the book of First John this morning. First John, chapter one, beginning in verse five, and then going all the way through chapter two, verse two. If you're using a pew Bible, that's page 1021, page 1021, 1 John chapter 1. God says this through the Apostle John to us, to you this morning. Would you stand with me? This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Father, in these minutes to follow, we ask that you would come. Come and help us to hear your word, understand it, and cause me to rightly divide it. In Jesus' name and for his fame we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I want to I want to ask you to think with me for just a moment about a track. Maybe you've been to the track just down here at Earlham. Some of you have been there a lot. And uh, one of the first things you recognize when you step foot on a track are the lines. It's pretty obvious. And you might wonder, what are those lines there for? Maybe it's obvious. And you quickly find out if you're a man of my stature, as you're in lane two and you look over your shoulder and look at lane one, and you go, the man in lane one's not to be trifled with. They're there for my safety. They're there for my good. But also, as you begin to run on the track, you begin to realize that uh, the lines, they, they keep you going in the right direction. They're not just there for your safety, they also keep you going the right way, so you don't veer off into some unknown territory like the football field, where only fools dare to tread. I think in a very similar way, the book of 1 John gives us guardrails in our life for our good and for our safety, to keep us going in the right direction. Guardrails don't save anybody, though. Only Jesus does. And so what we're going to be finding here is we're going to be seeing two guardrails of the Christian life for our good, that we might stay safe, but we also might be going in the right direction. 
But if you run in a race called life and you don't know where you're running, well, that's not good. The lines don't do anything for you. You also need to recognize that there's a goal at the end, and that's Christ. We've been discussing what it means in the book of Ephesians of how to walk in the light, how to expose the darkness in the world out there. The way you live exposes the darkness and people begin to see what it is. Begin to see the darkness for what it really is. And I just can't go on without going with you a little bit more into that. Not just exposing the darkness out there, but what the Bible has to tell us about exposing the darkness right here. That's where we're headed today. We're gonna, it's, this is, totally complements the book of Ephesians. How to fellowship with God. How to fellowship with God. You. How to have fellowship with Him. And this is the main idea of 1 John 1, verse 5 through 2, 2. And it's this. Fellowship with God is breaking your fellowship with sin. Fellowship with God is breaking your fellowship with sin. And the Apostle John gives you two guardrails to show you what fellowship looks like. Line on the track number one, fellowship with God is walking in the light. Line on the track number two, fellowship with God is confessing your sins. And then the third thing he tells you is, what do you look at when you run? Where do you look? You don't keep your eyes down, but you look up and you look to Christ. That's where we're headed today. Fellowship with God is walking in the light. Fellowship with God is confessing your sin. And fellowship with God is running to your Savior. So let's look at these together more in depth. Guardrail number one. Line on the track number one. Fellowship with God is walking in the light. We see that in verses uh, five through seven. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness... We lie. We do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So here's the question. What does fellowship with God look like? And the answer is right there. Fellowship with God is walking in the light. Should remind us of Ephesians chapter 5 a lot. But I want you to know what's going on in John's day. In the Apostle John's day, and in our day today, people called the Gnostics were teaching, it doesn't matter how you live your life. It doesn't matter what you do in this body. They were teaching an early form of Gnosticism that said, you can separate the body and the spirit. And what happens down here in the body has no bearing on the eternal spirit. And John is saying, that's not what we heard from Christ. You should look there. It says, this is not what we have heard. Instead, we want you, the true church, to know that God is light. He is holy, holy, holy. He is pu- he's perfect. He's pure. He's just. His character is absolute righteousness. That's why verse 5 says what it says. This is the message we have heard. Don't listen to the Gnostics. Don't listen to the message that the entire world is shoving down your throats. Doesn't matter how you live in this life. That's not what we've heard from Christ. John is saying, the Gnostics, the people in your schools, the people in your communities, your neighbors, your co-workers, they don't know Christ like you do. And so why would you take advice and life advice from those who have never known what living is really like. God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Children of light, if you're a Christian, you get this. You love God's Word. You love to hear the words of Jesus when He says in John 8, Jesus said to them, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Fellowship with God is walking in the light. So when we see verse 6 of our passage saying, if we have fellowship with him, with God, while we walk in darkness, we lie, and we do not practice the truth, we say, of course. 
You can't live in the light and in the darkness at the same time. It doesn't work. When you turn a light switch on, darkness vanishes. It doesn't exist next to the light. I can see the light in the dark right next to each other. That's, that's not how it works. You can't say that you're a Christian when it's clear you don't love Jesus Christ. You can't say you're a Christian when there's no life, no adoration, no satisfaction in Jesus. You can't say you're a Christian when you live a life like someone in the darkness. You can't say you're a Christian when there's no war, when there's no battle, when there's no fight, when there's no disgust that leads to action over the sin and darkness in your life. Because if you start saying that, well, I'm a Christian, but my life has no semblance and I don't care how I live my life, it's the exact same as you Yelling on the rooftops, I'm a vegetarian, as you chew on a chicken leg. You can yell as much as you want. It's obvious. You chewing on that chicken leg betrays your profession. And I like chicken. I'm not saying anything bad about chicken. But he's not a vegetarian if he's chewing on a chicken leg. The Gnostics are saying in John's day and people in our day are saying it doesn't matter how you live your life. But God is telling us here very clearly, no, I am the light. If you walk with me, you walk in holiness, you walk in purity. You love the light and you hate its deception. I mean, you, you hate the, darks, the darkness deception and its corruption. So friends, if you have true fellowship with God, a saving relationship with him, You've seen the light of the gospel of the glory of God. And it has shined on the eyes of your hearts in such a way that it changes everything about you. That's been Ephesians. And I want you to see how it just so perfectly fits with 1 John. And it gives us even more. When your vision changes, when you finally have eyes to see, you could never see the darkness before. Now you can see a contrast. That's, that's being born again. That's having, that's having the light. That's being light. That you can actually see the darkness for what it is. And it changes you. It leaves you completely altered. We used the illustration a long time ago about being hit by a Mack truck. And it leaves you devastatingly different. How much bigger is God then if he hits you? In case you've forgotten, Ephesians 5, 8 and 9. Let me just read that again from a few weeks ago. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. So here's the question. Why do you walk in the light? I, I hear I'm supposed to. Why do I walk in the light? Why do you do that? And the answer is in verse 7. We walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The Christian has been cleansed by Jesus. If you've repented of your sin, trusted in Jesus, that's the beginning of walking in the light. God has come in, in the work and person of Jesus, and he's cleansed you. You behave like a cleansed man or woman because you've been cleansed. Cleansed people behave like cleansed people. The gospel is true. Therefore, I, I act like it's true. And some Christians in this room today really need to hear that. Some of us in this room really need to hear the words, you need to turn away from the darkness right now, friends. Or it'll kill you. That sin that you entertain, it will have its way with you. It will be your doom. Any sin that you excuse or you deem pardonable in comparison to others, so many in our midst, in my life, that I think that's more respectable sin than others. Friends, that will destroy you. So what can you do? You can fellowship with God by walking in the light is what you can do. And you walk in the light because Jesus has cleansed you. It's like that hymn, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. 
Why? Why do I owe him everything? Because sin had left a crimson stain, and he washed it white as snow. It's gone. It's been removed from me, placed on Jesus at the cross, and my Savior drank the wrath of God that I deserved fully, forever. So have you been cleansed? Another hymn. Have you been washed by the blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? If you knew not Christ this morning, would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. And dear ones, a washed, cleansed child of God wants to walk in the light, wants to walk in the light newness because they're his child it's something we've been discussing often i don't want to go over it too much but how can you go over it too much we need to hear this you've been given a gift that is immeasurable in worth because god himself light itself is in you working and willing that you might make it to the end god's in there and this radically shapes the way you walk in so many ways. The, the Christian thinks like Potiphar, or Joseph with Potiphar's wife, when he or she is tempted. How can I sin against God like this? Look at what God has done for me. And he repents and runs away. Or when some kind of juicy gossip gets shared with you, and you think, oh, I could... I could totally give in to this. I could just dive headlong. No, that's slander. I've been cleansed. I don't got to walk in slander. Or the person who's about to eat another piece of cake and says, I'm in danger of gluttony. I've been cleansed. I can't insist on acting like I haven't been cleansed. I don't need to eat another piece of cake. It might sound silly to you. Is that respectable to you, though? Is that a respectable sin of gluttony? Or the way you drink alcohol? By no means is alcohol sinful, just like money is not sinful, just like sex is not sinful. But when you hear the words of Paul, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it to the glory of God. Is your alcohol consumption, is your cake eating consistent with that? That you look at what you're about to ingest and you say, I do that to the glory of God. If your habits are not ruled by that, do you know the light? Friends, this is so good for us, and I, we need to hear this. The child of light says, I hate the reality that my God's glory would be diminished by my eating this, by my drinking this, because it won't bring him glory. Or the person who's anxious We've got a world of Christians that excuse the sin of anxiety. They worry and worry and trust in their circumstances, their own abilities, and they're anxious. And they hear the words of Jesus, do not be anxious, a command from your Savior. And they snap out of it if they're a child of light. Because they've been cleansed. I don't have to be anxious. If God, if my Savior can cleanse dirty, rotten, polluted, dark me, what? He can do anything. I don't got to trust my circumstance or my, my abilities. The same God who ransomed me has me in his hands. That's a child of light. That's walking with him in the light. Or the person who has done something wrong, hurt a spouse, hurt a church member, or hurt your children, and the person who's been cleansed can say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You don't have to hide, friends, if you've been cleansed. You do not have to hide behind the facade that you have it all together. You do not have to hide your sin because you have been cleansed. God has seen everything himself. And everyone around you that's a Christian has been cleansed the same exact way. You do not have to hide. The, 
the child of God says this, the, the, the child of light and walking in light, if you realize you've been cleansed, you say, I've been cleansed. I didn't bring the soap. I didn't bring the washcloth. I didn't bring the water. I didn't bring the new clothes. I didn't bring the scrubber. I brought nothing but my sin and my dirt. God in his kindness, he made me clean. So I won't walk in darkness. I will re be resolved to not walk in gluttony or anxiety or drunkenness or corrupt speech or pride or immorality or selfishness or worldliness. A cleansed person, friends, walks in the light because he's been cleansed. And young children, how do you walk in the light? How do you do that? You listen to your mom and dad even when you don't want to. Even when you don't get it. So long as your mom or dad is following Jesus, you follow them because you know they're following the author of light. And I don't get it, but I want to I walk in the light. And if they're headed towards the light, I want to follow them. That's how you do that. So that's what it means to walk in the light. It's a life not marked by willful, unrepentant sin because you've been hit by Jesus. And when you get hit by Jesus, it breaks your fellowship with sin. Fellowship with God is breaking your fellowship with sin, and it means walking in the light. And that's guardrail number one. Now the second guardrail. Guardrail number one was walking in the light. The second guardrail on the track. Line number two, fellowship with God is confessing your sin. Fellowship with God is confessing your sin. We're to pursue holiness, we're to walk in the light, but never to think that we're sinless. We find this in verses 8 to 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. Fellowship with God is confessing your sins. Walking in the light is confessing your sins. They, they're not exclusive of one another. When you walk in the light, you... You drag all of you in the light with you. You don't leave chunks of you behind in the darkness. And so how do you how do you walk in light? How do you drag all of your lust, all of your pride, all of your sin into the light? And the answer is this by confessing your sins. It's right there in the text. Confessing your sins. I mean, if you find yourself, as a Christian right now, I'm in the darkness. I, what do I do? How do I forsake this thing? How do I forsake my sin? Confess your sins. If you uh, were to ever look at fungus, you know, it's putrid and moist. And, well, people don't like that word, moist. But if you were to look at it, it thrives in the dark, damp areas. But as soon as you expose fungus and bacteria to light it can't thrive anymore and it's not instantaneous but uv light destroys fungus destroys and kills bacteria friends as we walk in the light we are to bring all of ourselves into the light we are to bring all of ourselves in and when you do that, when you drag your sin, your flesh, you put all your darkest secrets out for God to see, He already knows them, there's also another thing I want to encourage you to do because John encourages you to do it, God encourages you to do it. You not only confess your sins to God, but you confess your sins to others. Stay, stay with me here, I, I, I want to bring you back to verse 7. Look in verse 7 for a moment. When we walk in the light, we have fellowship with God, but with who else? Look there. We have fellowship with God and with one another. That's not a mistake. When you walk in the light, your vertical relationship and confession of your sins with God bleeds into a horizontal relationship and confession with God your fellow brothers and sisters. James 5.16. Listen to this. Confess your sins to one another, James says, and pray for one another 
that you may be healed. Who knows about what you're going through? Who do you confess your sins to? Where's your accountability? Yes, to God first, absolutely. He alone can cleanse you, but Scripture is chocked full of exhortations and commands to confess our sins to one another. Just listen. If you're, if you're taking notes, write these down. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Jesus tells us you can't worship rightly before God if you haven't been reconciled to your brother. Right worship isn't possible. How do you get reconciled with your brother? Confession. Galatians 6, 1. We're to help restore each other in the faith. How do we help restore each other? Galatians tells us through confession. Or our text just weeks ago in Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians 4.32, we are to work to forgive each other. Confession is an essential part of that. Wouldn't it be great? I want this so bad for our church. Wouldn't it be great if this church could walk in the light together? Wouldn't it be amazing if our congregation truly was involved in one another's lives in such a way that gets right, right past the facade of a person and says, when I pray for you, I really pray for you. I know what's going on in your life. I know what you're wrestling with. I know what you're battling with. I love you enough to ask the hard questions, and I go to battle when I pray for you. And that's not easy, but it would be good. That's what discipleship is. That's life on life. That's life in a church. That's light in a church. And that's really uncomfortable, friends. But saints, this is a means of grace that you and I cannot ignore in our lives. We must walk in the light, and therefore we must confess our sins and this is fellowship with God and one another. We shouldn't be surprised by this, by brothers and sisters confessing their sins to one another. That shouldn't surprise us. It should surprise us when it's not happening. It should concern us when life in the church does not include this. That should be surprising. Like we said before, getting cleansed frees you not to have to hide behind the facade of having it all together, you don't have to hide. Fellowship with God is confessing your sins, yes, to God and to one another. You don't have to stay in the dark. You're surrounded by brothers and sisters who are debtors to mercy and debtors to grace and cleansed the same way as you. Your only hope is God's grace in the gospel. You don't have to hide. Now, friends, I am not tell, not, I'm not for a moment encouraging you to broadcast your sins for the entire congregation to hear. I'm not arguing for a megaphone-type confession. That, at times, might be good, occasionally. But the normative, what we have here, is not, I'm going to tell you all everything from last week. What I mean is that there are people in our lives that we should be talking to. There are people in our lives that for the sake of God's glory, for their joy and your joy and for God's glory, that we'd get real with, that we'd walk in the light with. Would you do that? Would you consider getting a brother and sister and talking to them? Get someone that's reliable, trustworthy, able to hold your confidence, mature in the faith, in love with Jesus and in love with you enough to ask you hard questions? Loves you enough to be real. Finding a brother or sister like this, getting real with them like this, that's walking in the light. That's what it is. This is part of what it means to fellowship with God. And if you don't know that, and now you do. <laughs> I mean, just recently, this is hard to say. Uh, weeks ago, I uh, shared that I was wrestling with some ungodly desires and thoughts as I was prepping for my sermon. War going on in my heart. And I, um, it was not easy, but I spoke with the elders of our church. Uh, 
confess to my wife things I was wrestling with. And it made me sick to my stomach having to talk to them about that. This is what's going on here and here. And I don't want them to manifest into grosser sins. I don't want these things to have dominion over me. Would you pray for me? This is one of the hardest text messages I've ever sent in my life was to the elders. I said, I'm wrestling. And I don't want this. Would you pray? Talk to my wife. And it's even hard to talk to you about it right now, but as a cleansed child of God, I didn't have to hide. I don't have to hide now. I'm walking in the light. Would you walk in the light with a few brothers, a few sisters? Confession, hard but so right and so good for you, dear one. Fellowship with God means breaking your fellowship with sin and Fellowship with God, therefore, looks like walking in the light, and fellowship with God, therefore, looks like confessing your sins. That you would walk in humility before God and a few members of this church. So those are the two lines on the track. Those are the two lines for your good and for your safety, that you'd go in the right direction. But if you don't know where you're running to, if you just look at the two lines and say, I've got to walk in the light, I've got to confess my sins, and that's all you get today, you won't do it. The reason you run in a race, anybody that's been on the track knows there's a goal. I'm looking at a prize. My, my eyes are set on something more than just the lines on the track. The lines on the track are worthless if you don't have what you're looking at. And that's the third point in today's talk. The third principle that John gives us. Fellowship with God is running to your Savior. It's not where do you look, but it's who do you look to. Fellowship with God is running to your Savior. We see that in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the Righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Fellowship with God is running to your Savior. It's running to your one and only advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And I just want to point out, do you see the sweet wording here? Do you see the sweet wording? My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you wouldn't sin. So you wouldn't. But if you do, if you do, Jesus Christ is yours. Take him. Look at him. Don't look down at the track and at yourself and at all your shortcomings and all your failures. Look back to Jesus Christ who was made sin for you. For every one look at yourself, take a hundred looks at him. For every one look down, take a hundred looks up to Jesus. I, just, I need to hear that this morning. I don't know if, did anybody else need to hear that? Can I, amen on anybody? No amens. This church doesn't like amens. <laughs> I'm going to say to myself, amen. <laughs> Look to Jesus. I mean, you just get the language here. He's your advocate. He's your propitiation. Notice he doesn't say Mary's your advocate. St. Patrick's your advocate. St. John, your advocate, none of that. No, an advocate is someone that pleads before, intercedes before you with the Father. They are not your advocate. There is one, and that is Christ. And this Christ, he pleads for you. He pleads for those that belong to him. But even better than, he's your propitiation. He's your propitiation. Advocate's great, but if he's also my, not just my advocate, not just the one that pleads for me, but he's my propitiation, my substitute, he bore the wrath reserved for me so that all I know is grace. Oh, you sing the hymn, oh, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was blind. Right? I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. 
I see Christ. I see God in life. I want Him. I want to run to Him. He's my advocate. He's my propitiation. For your sins and for the whole world. His work on the cross was sufficient for all. We could go down a really long rabbit trail here. We won't. Listen, please. For you and the whole world, all are welcome to come to Christ. All are welcome to come to Christ. It's commanded, repent and believe the gospel. But only those who he has chased after, only those who he has gone after, remember Ephesians 5, the the picture of of election, of ruined sinners running away, hell bound, and in his kindness he chased after some. His work was sufficient for all, but efficient means it does a work, effects a work, in the elect. And I just want you to know, friends, that if you wrestle with the idea, you're asking the question, am I elect? He he died for the sins of the world. He says, come. And if you come, if you say, I need Christ, dead people don't come. Elect people come. And if you see your need for Jesus, you see he's my advocate, he's my substitute, I have no hope apart from him, Oh, friends, you are a Christian. Run to Jesus. The question has never been, am I elect? It's not in the Bible. That's not a question you should ask, am I the elect? The question you should ask is, am I trusting in Jesus? Have I repented of my sins? That's the question. And if you have, if you do, if you look to Jesus, you elect. Lost people can't do that. Rejoice and be glad that in God's kindness he's ran after you. And if you're a Christian already, I must say it again, would you come again in confession and repentance? Would you look afresh this morning at Jesus and say, this is my Savior. Look at him. Look at what he's done for me. And I look at my brother and sister and I say, I want to walk with you in the light. Would you do that? Because he's your propitiation. I was teaching fifth grade, my first year of teaching, so 10 years ago. First class ever, wonderful class, but also one of my hardest years because I was a new guy. I had this one young man, won't say his name, he really pushed the envelope, really was, well, he was very disrespectful. I tried all these different techniques I knew to discipline, none of it was working, so I had to come down with the big daddy. I sat him down, I said, Young man, because you have been disrespectful, I'm going to make you look up the definition of respect and a few other words, and you're going to have to write those down from the dictionary, Merriam-Webster's dictionary, word for word, letter for letter, comma for comma, pronunciation key for pronunciation key, perfect. You mess up once, you start over during recess. First recess goes by, he makes a small dent in it. Second recess goes by, a boy is sad. Third recess comes, and he's just, this is the worst punishment ever. I go up to him, and I say, young man, um, I'm going to take this definition for you. I'm going to take this dictionary, I'm going to put it in my lap, and I'm going to finish it for you. And I'm going to let you, you go free. You see my face. So I'm not just going to close the dep- close the book and put it off to the side. I'm going to sit here and write it out for you while you go free. And I looked at him, truthfully, I said, this is called propitiation. And my fifth grader had no clue what I was talking about. But I said, propitiation is when someone takes the punishment that you deserve and satisfies it in your place, deals with it doesn't sweep it under the rug. He says, I will so complete this that it will never come back to you again. That's what I'm doing for you, young man. He did not get propitiation. (laughs) But this is one thing he did get. He got he was free. He got he was, his punishment was dealt with. Propitiation or not, his face lit up with light. And he radiated joy as he ran back to his friends on the basketball court. Never seen a happier kid in that moment. 
because his punishment had been propitiated. I must add something, though. Right before he went off, I pulled him aside. Right before he ran off, and I said, the only difference is between what I'm doing for you and what God did for me. I said, Jesus did this for me a long time ago. I didn't even get my definition started. I didn't even, I didn't even know how to write the definition. And God did it all for me on the cross. Friends, that's the truth about all of God's children. You haven't started on your definition. You haven't started to pay God back. You never can. Your debt is immeasurable. And though our sins are many, His mercy is more. So if you know Him not, I encourage you, come talk to one of the elders. Come talk to me. Come talk to a member of this church and say, I don't know Jesus in this way, that I would so look at Christ Fellowship with God is looking to our Savior. I don't know Him in such a way that when I look at Jesus, I got joy. That my, I know my sins have been forgiven. Come talk to us. Come talk to a member of this church. I ask that you would be resolved to fight for your joy. And if you do, if you walk in the light, you'll see the two lines on the track, and you'll see them as joyous things, not burdens. And you'll run the race in life for the glory of God and for your joy always looking to your Savior. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that in Christ, that in Christ, our sins have been dealt with, that your mercy and grace is greater than our sins. Oh Lord, we ask that in the moments that follow and in the days that follow, that there would be a resolve in this body to truly walk in the light together in such a way that when I look and when these brothers and sisters look at each other, they go, I really know him or her because we've all been redeemed, cleansed, and we don't hide anymore. You've called us to walk in light. I ask that you would do that. Cause your people to obey you and do a work that only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray.